I first met Dr. Pauline uh, several years ago. I don't even know whether, uh, whether he remembers it. He was actually a student uh, at Andrews University studying his, uh, for his uh, doctoral degree when uh, Jan and I were seminary students there back in the uh, early 1980s. And uh, I never had an opportunity to have him as a professor, but I've always enjoyed uh, his presentations from time to time when we've had an opportunity to hear him. And uh, he taught on the campus of Andrews University in the New Testament department for a number of years. And for the last several years, he has been dean of the School of Religion at Loma Linda University. And so we're pleased to be able to have him uh, with us. And uh, like I say, our paths have crossed from time to time. I don't even remember, John, I think it was six years ago this summer, we taught together at Zowski. Remember when uh, we taught in the doctor's ministry intensive there for uh, Dr. John Dibdahl. So uh, I thought, hey, he's close. He's only over in Loma Linda. We need to get him here. And I know that you will enjoy the rest of his presentations. This one uh, that he's giving now during the uh, worship service and then following our fellowship dinner, uh, two more presentations that I know will really enhance your understanding of the book of Revelation and God's last day people. So, John, thank you so much for coming and bless you as you present his word now. As we begin, I want to mention just a couple of things by way of uh, process here. And I've chosen not to uh, use the computer for this presentation, but uh, simply a Bible. So I'd like you to take a Bible, and if you don't have a Bible, do it my way. Bring out your tablet, your phone, wherever you've got it, and uh, turn to Revelation chapter 12. And uh, we're going to be looking at the Bible, and we're going to be settling in on a text so we're not going to be jumping around, and uh, that, that has its usefulness at times. We're going to be settling in on a particular part uh, of the book of Revelation and looking at it together. I'll be using the English Standard Version, and I want to be clear that uh, there's no perfect version of the Bible, so I'm not using that because it's the best. It happens to be the one that I feel gets the closest to the original language, at least at significant points, so I've come to appreciate that. But whatever translation you have, uh, let's uh, be looking at the Bible together. That's the purpose that we have here. Now, the larger purpose for the weekend is to explore something about the remnant concept, which is tied in very closely uh, with Seventh-day Adventist self-understanding. So if you're a Seventh-day Adventist this morning, and I understand that uh, most of you are, but if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you may want to take some notes because we'll be exploring some of the key biblical moves that concern the identity of uh, Seventh-day Adventists, why they think the way they do, why they relate to the world the way they do. And if you're joining us uh, from uh, outside that tradition, uh, I'm delighted that you're here. Welcome, and uh, you will find this presentation, I think, very interesting because it will go beyond uh, just a simple denominational view, but it will say some things about the wider world that I think you'll find very, very significant uh, for your own life as well. So uh, welcome to all of you. We're going to be looking at the Bible together, and uh, I think that in the process we will learn some things. Some of what I will do is, is simply going through the background of uh, how a Seventh-day Adventist can look at the book of Revelation, but there are also going to be some surprises, some things that probably most of you have never seen in the text before. And I want to start out by saying, as we look at this text, I want you to keep in mind that the book of Revelation really is a story or a series of stories. And one of the challenges I find is that, that Seventh-day Adventists, for one, uh, along with many other Christians, have a tendency to read the book of Revelation to go somewhere else. You want to read the book of Revelation to learn about history. You want to read the book of Revelation to learn about the future. And we sometimes miss the story. I mentioned in the first session that Revelation is a lot like the movie Lion King. 
Lion King was probably the most popular cartoon ever made. And it was an animal story set in the African grasslands. But it's not really an animal story, if you know it. It's more about people and how they relate to each other. It's about a ruined world that is restored by the actions of a son. It's actually an African apocalypse. So it's a lot like the book of Revelation. Revelation is a cartoon fantasy. There are things that happen there that don't happen anywhere else. If you happen to go out into the hills here, you know, it's perhaps up at the Reagan Ranch, and you run into an animal out there that has seven heads and ten horns, what will you know? You'll know that you've been drinking. <laughs> so they don't exist in real life, animals with seven heads and ten horns. That's not real. Uh, vultures that fly through the air giving messages to the people below. That's not real. It's a fantasy story. But sometimes fantasy stories speak to truth in a way that gets to our hearts. You know, they're not in your face and saying, you got to do this. But rather it tells a story that's beyond human uh, experience. And when the story is done, you say, now wait a minute. That has implications for me. And that's the whole point in a fantasy. So the book of Revelation is like that. And I found that when you miss the story, you sometimes miss the point. So let's pay careful attention to the story that's going on here in the book of Revelation. And I'd have to say that the main point of the book of Revelation is to tell us this one thing. When the end of time comes, things will not be as they seem to be. When the end of time comes, things will not be as they seem to be. Now, if you go out to Catalina Island, and you go up on the highest point of the hill, and you look out over the ocean, how do things seem to be? It seems that the world is flat, but it's not. It's an illusion. Things are not always what they seem to be. I remember when we moved into our first house, with a yard and all that kind of good stuff. And our daughter, Tammy, who just made us grandparents three weeks ago, our daughter, Tammy, was about two and a half at the time. And she'd never lived in a house before. Now, along with the house came an electric lawnmower. I can see why I've never bought one of those. But I inherited one along with the house. And it had this 100-foot cord. And you have to be very careful to go, go in very particular pattern because otherwise you're going to run over the cord and the thing stops. Okay, So I was going back and forth and my daughter was standing on the back deck and she's watching me do these patterns in the grass with this humming machine with the long cord and she's trying to figure out what on earth is daddy doing? And suddenly she got it. She understood. She went running back into the house. And she says, Mommy, come look. Daddy's cleaning the grass. <laughs> now, she'd seen me run a vacuum cleaner before, but never a lawnmower. You see, things are not always what they seem to be. And that's the message of the book of Revelation. And I think it's a message that the world is ready for today. Because I think that's one of the major themes of many movies today, that things are not always what they seem to be. It's almost as if God is preparing the world for the message of Revelation. Have any of you ever heard the story of the Matrix? That's a fantasy too. But it fantasizes the idea that one day the computers will get so smart that they'll be in charge of us. Does that ever worry you? It worries a lot of people today technology may get out of control. And when the computers are smarter than we are, and when they have artificial intelligence, and when they can think faster than we can, they may end up in charge. And so it envisioned the world in which the computers are in charge, and that human beings are put into a fantasy state so that they can provide battery power 
for the machines. So human beings are living in a world they can see, they can hear, they can feel, they can taste, they can touch, but it's only electric signals in the brain. They're actually asleep. And these are being fed by a computer program. Everything they experienced, everything they saw, was just in their imagination. It wasn't real. That's what the book of Revelation is telling us. That's what the story of Revelation is telling us. When the end of time comes, things will not be as they seem. What your eyes see, what your ears hear, what your hands handle may seem real, but it will not be. So let's get into the story of Revelation and see how that works itself out. If you're in chapter 12, uh, let me give you a quick summary. Chapter 12 really covers the whole history of the Christian age. It begins with Jesus. He's a male child in verse 5 that ends up being caught up to heaven. And some fantastic things happen in the course of the chapter. The chapter 12 really gives us a nutshell view of human history from the time of Jesus and even before. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the universe. And that whole sweep of history comes to the end of the chapter. And in verse 17, at the end of the chapter, you come to now. You've gone through all the stages of history and now you've come to the end of the world and chapter 12 verse 17 summarizes the entire end time in one verse. So the whole picture is put together in a nutshell. Does that interest you? You want to know how things are all going to turn out in a nutshell? Let's go. Chapter 12, in verse 17, it says, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Well, we're going to talk more about that this afternoon and detail some of those things. However, here's the crucial thing. Throughout the chapter, there have been two main characters, the dragon and the woman. When you study it, the dragon represents Satan, dragon represents evil, the dragon represents all the powers of the world that oppress people. The woman, on the other hand, represents God's people, represents the faithful ones, those who are in this world who are seeking to serve God, those who are oppressed often, those who are persecuted for their faith. So you have two main sides in chapter 12. The dragon on the one side and the woman on the other. But then it goes on to say something interesting. It says the dragon became furious with the woman, but he went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Or as that word is sometimes translated, on the remnant of her offspring. So the focus at the end of time is no longer on the woman, but on a remnant, the last piece. Now, what is a remnant? What is the rest? What's the leftovers? You know, if you're thinking in terms of a bolt of cloth, the remnant is that last piece that's still there after the rest of the cloth has been sold. It's the remnant. When you think uh, of genocide, you know, I mentioned uh, earlier today that my mother uh, was uh, part of the receiving end of the Holocaust, some of the horrible events that took place back in Germany. And it's only because she was an American citizen that she was able to get away before things really got bad. But uh, the Holocaust uh, is an example of what happens sometimes where there was a group of people that hated so much another group of people that they sought to exterminate them from the face of this earth. And that's not the only time that that has happened in history. And this whole concept of a remnant, of those that are left over, is used in the Bible to talk about times when there's an attempt to destroy a whole community of people. But thankfully, many Jews survived the Holocaust. 
And as a result, Judaism is still here. And these people are still here to bear witness to the Sabbath and to many good things that God has done for them and for all of us. However, however, in order to survive, you have to have a remnant. There's got to be some people left over. If every last person had been destroyed, then that whole community would be gone. You see? So this remnant concept is a powerful concept that God keeps faith alive in a remnant. And this afternoon, we're going to go deep in that, and you're going to find that that has powerful implications for today's world. The greatest need of the world today is answered by the concept of the remnant. But we'll only cover that this afternoon, so you've got to come back if you're interested in that. But in a nutshell, the final battle is between the dragon, who represents Satan, evil, oppressors, the dragon and the remnant, God's faithful people at the very end of time. So that's the battle here. Now look what happens. It says the dragon became furious with the woman, and how did he make war with the remnant of her seed? It says he went off, or the original language says he went away to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now, that's kind of odd, don't you think? You know, Pastor Phil, I think if I wanted to make war with you, I wouldn't go that way. I would go this way. And I'd come right down these stairs, and I'd come right up to you, and I'd punch you right in the nose. Now, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to do that today, okay? But if I want to make war with you, that's what I would do. The dragon does the opposite. You might even call him chicken. How's that for a big lizard? Chicken lizard. Ah, okay, I like that. All right, so the dragon doesn't go right after the remnant. He goes away. You say, what's going on here? Why is the dragon running away? He's supposed to be making war. Well, that's part of the story, remember? Stick to the story. Because in the story, the dragon's been a loser from the beginning. He makes war with the woman in heaven. He makes war with the, uh, the male child. He makes war back in heaven with uh, Michael and his angels. And then he makes war on earth with the woman again. Over and over he does it, and every time he fails. He never succeeds in his mission. And so... Now it's coming to the very final battle of earth's history. The dragon knows he's in trouble. So in order to fight the last battle of earth's history, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to get help. He's failed all the way through. He needs help. And so he goes to get help. And it says at the very end there, he stood on the sand of the sea. How's that for making war? Instead of going to fight, he goes to the beach, the sand of the sea. All right? So here he is, standing on the sand of the sea. Now imagine it's Santa Monica, okay, not too far from here. He's standing on the beach in Santa Monica, and suddenly out of the ocean comes this enormous monster with seven heads and ten horns. And it comes out of the sea, and he sees first the horns, you know, just peeking up out of the water, and then the head, and then the body, and then the feet, and so on. It's coming right at him. And then he turns around on the sea, and another huge monster comes up out of the earth. Obliterates Los Angeles. No, actually, that's just the story. Okay, so he's got the two monsters, one coming out of the sea, and one coming up out of the earth. He says, I'm not going into this last battle alone. I need help. I'm going to get lots of help. And so you have a dragon, and you have a monster out of the sea, and you have a monster out of the earth. How many does that make? Three. Now, do you happen to know how God is portrayed in the book of Revelation? God is also portrayed 
in threes. It says, the one sitting on the throne is the one who is and who was and who is to come. And in several other places, God is portrayed in terms of threes. Now, I want to make one thing very clear. When you talk about God in terms of threes, it does not mean you're talking about three gods. The Bible is always clear there is one God. But that one God comes to us in the form of three. That's complicated, and people have wrestled with that for centuries. We're not going to go into that today. But I simply want to leave the point that God in the book of Revelation is described in terms of three. For example, the one sitting on the throne, the seven spirits before the throne, and Jesus Christ in chapter 1. Three, repeatedly in the book of Revelation, three. Now the dragon becomes three. Do you think there might be a connection in the story? Is the dragon trying to do something here? Is it possible that the three with the dragon are a counterfeit of God? in some way? I believe that that's the case. But let's take a look at the text. Remember, stay with the story. There's a lot of places we could go from chapter 13, but we stay with the story because chapter 13 explains what the dragon is doing on the beach. He explains how the dragon will fight the final war. Let's get acquainted with this monster from the sea. I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, chapter 13, verse 1, with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. Now, diadems are a royal kind of crown. So this particular beast has ten crowns or diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. Now, let's stop here for a minute. We've already noticed, if you run into an animal with seven heads and ten horns, you know you have a problem, okay? Not going to find it out in the field here. But let me ask you another question. If you were to find two animals with seven heads and ten horns, what would you know? You know that you discovered a new species. There's more than one of these things. And here's the interesting piece, because the dragon in chapter 12 is described how? Seven heads, ten horns. The monster from the sea, seven heads and ten horns. They look alike. They're twins. The monster that comes out of the sea looks just like the dragon. Now, when Jesus was on earth, someone once asked him, what is God like? How can we know him? And what did Jesus say? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. In other words, Jesus came down to this earth to show us what God is like. Imagine if you were God and you wanted to explain yourself to people. How would you do it? Well, you could send prophets, but those are human beings trying to explain God. That might not work. Uh, you could shine pretty lights in the sky and get everybody wowed like a fireworks display, but that wouldn't tell them a whole lot. You could make stars and planets and so on. But ultimately, if God wants to communicate to us, the best way to do it is to come down and be one of us. God wants to communicate with us to become one of us. And the amazing story of the gospel is that God chose to come down, to become human, to be among us, to teach us what God is really like. What you couldn't learn completely from Mount Sinai, what you couldn't learn completely from creation, what you couldn't learn completely from the prophets, you could learn if God in the flesh is there before you showing 
what God is like. That's the amazing story of the gospel. If you have seen me, Jesus said, you have seen the Father. Now we have a beast from the earth that looks just like the dragon. If you've seen the beast from the sea, you have seen the dragon. So this beast coming out of the sea is a deliberate counterfeit of the ministry of Jesus. That's why I said stay with the story. Because sometimes we miss the story with all the references. Well, this beast is this and it's that and it's got these horns mean this and the heads mean that and so on. But stay with the story this morning because there's something really significant. Verse 2. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power, his throne, and great authority. Now, first of all, those of you that have studied the Bible with great care, this leopard, bear, and lion, you ever seen that anywhere else in the Bible? Daniel chapter 7. Okay. These are animals that represent the oppressive powers of the world. So by mentioning this beast looks like a leopard, a bear, and a lion, it's reminding the reader of Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, it portrays the history of the nations of the world. You know, the lion represented Babylon, and the bear represented Persia, and the leopard represented Greece. And now you're living in the time of Rome. And the dragon of chapter 12 seems to represent Rome as well as Satan. And so you have all this history behind you. And now the prophet projects into the future there will be a beast from the sea that will be like those earlier kingdoms. It will have a piece of Babylon in it. It will have a piece of Persia in it, a piece of Greece and a piece of Rome. And we know, of course, that the culture of New Testament times was a Greco-Roman culture. It was a mixture of Greek and Roman, and that the Greek uh, looked back on the Persians and the Babylonians. So the book of Revelation is giving us, in fantasy, solid history with a projection of how things will turn out in the end. Very exciting stuff. To this beast, it says, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. So this beast comes out of the sea, and the dragon gives the beast his power, his throne, his authority. Now here's where it gets interesting again. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Who gave it to Jesus? It came from God. His power, his authority came from God. The power and the authority of this beast from the sea came from the dragon. This beast from the sea is a deliberate counterfeit of Jesus Christ. It gets even more interesting in verse 3. It says, One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Now keep your finger there and just go with me to verse 8 for just a moment. It says, all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Now what you're going to miss, here my ESV betrayed me just a little. All right. What you miss there is that word slain is exactly the same as verse 3, mortal wound. Same word. In Greek, there's about four ways to describe death and killing. This is one of those and not the most common one. This is a word that was often used in the sanctuary for slaying the lambs back in the Hebrew times. When the lambs were sacrificed, they were slaughtered. When Jesus was on the cross, he was slaughtered. The beast from the sea 
is slaughtered. But what else happens in verse 3? He had a wound unto death, but its wound unto death was healed. Now, if somebody dies and gets healed, what do you call that? A resurrection. Now, you might say, I, I don't know if I trust all this Greek stuff. How do I know that you're telling me the truth about the word, you know, that this mortal wound really means a death and a resurrection? Well, Scripture interprets Scripture. So turn with me to verse 14 of chapter 13. Revelation 13, 14. It says, By the signs it, allow, it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Sorry, betrayed me again. I was trying to help, but I didn't. The language there is very, very clear. It was the beast that was killed by the sword and came back to life. That's the language there. So anyway, you'll have to take it on a little bit of faith. But what is happening here is that the death of Jesus is mentioned in verse 8. Now there's the death of the sea beast. The sea beast has a death and a resurrection, just like Jesus. He's a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, they worship the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? And who can fight against it? Who is like the beast? Now, what you don't see on the surface here, and what a Hebrew would recognize in hearing this story, is that there is a name in Hebrew, called Michael. And that name is a question. It means, who is like God? Who is like God? But here, this beast from the sea, who is like the beast? The last time Jesus appears in the story is in chapter 12, where he's called Michael, Michael. Now the beast shows up, and he takes the meaning of the word. What you need to understand with the Hebrew is the names in Hebrew always signify character. The names have meaning. The reason Jacob is called Jacob is because his mother laughed. No, Isaac, I'm sorry. Isaac, Yitzhak in the Hebrew. Isaac means laughter. And the reason he was named Laughter is because when God told his mother that she was going to have a son at 90 years of age, she laughed. Ha! <laughs> That's funny. That's a laugh. So God says, fine, name your son Laughter. That'll remind you that I can do what you think is impossible. So the names always have meaning. Michael means who is like God. Now the beast becomes the anti-Michael. Who is like the beast? Verse 5, in verse 5, it says, The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for how long? Forty-two months. Forty-two months. Now, how long is forty-two months? It's three and a half years. Okay, those of you that know your Bibles, how long was Jesus' ministry on this earth? Three and a half years. You see what's going on here? This beast from a sea is a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. Now those of you that have studied this for a longer time, you're probably aware that this story is an indictment of Christianity. Christianity was raised up to bear witness to a great work that God did through Jesus, the Messiah. A work that might have been forgotten had those who followed Jesus not remembered what he said and wrote down what he taught and, and thought about what he did. So Christianity was here to preserve the remembrance of Jesus and to preserve a witness to what God did through Jesus. 
But Revelation 13 makes it clear that Christianity has been a very poor witness of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, thousands of Muslims were killed in the Crusades. Thousands of Jews were killed. Thousands even of Christians were killed by Christians in the Crusades. If you didn't agree with me, you know, there goes it. The Inquisition. Bosnia. Rwanda. I hate to tell you this. Rwanda is not only a Christian country, it's an evangelical country. It's an evangelical country, fervent, born-again type Christians. 11% of them are Seventh-day Adventists. And yet, those Christians, those evangelicals, and yes, some Seventh-day Adventists, slaughtered each other. Christianity has done a very poor job of bearing witness to Jesus who said, if you want to be greatest, become the servant of all. I don't see that in the history of Christianity, do you? So yes, we understand this text in chapter 13 is saying some very challenging things about the history of Christianity, but the Bible is accurate. The Bible tells the way things really are. It doesn't sugarcoat things. Say, oh, you're on my side, everything's cool. No. The Bible says if you bear the name of Jesus, you better live like Jesus. If you bear the name Christian, then you must not simply call yourself a Christian, but live as a Christian would live and should live. And so, yes, this story has deeper implications for the history. But staying with the story, it tells us that this great power in history that names the name of Jesus Christ is going to be a counterfeit. It will truly not witness for God as God intended. All right, let's move ahead. Chapter 13 to verse 11. There's a second beast, and this beast comes up out of the earth. And this beast is also part of this three, this demonic three, that will be on the evil side in the final conflict. Continuing with the story, verse 11, I saw another beast rising up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So there's another power on the earth here that is represented by a fantasy animal. And this power is of a different kind. It looks like a lamb. That's pretty safe, isn't it? Anybody feel real threatened in the presence of a lamb? No, they're kind of wimpy, you know, in a good way. But it ends up speaking like a dragon. So this character starts out looking pretty peaceful, looking pretty cool, looking pretty friendly, and ends up just like the dragon. And it says that it had two horns like a lamb. Now here's something you need to know. The word lamb appears 29 times in the book of Revelation. 28 times it refers to Jesus. The 29th time is here. This is a lamb-like beast. This is a beast that you would think, aha, finally, Jesus is going to be truly represented on this earth. Finally. So this beast looks like a lamb. So is this another counterfeit of Jesus? No, it is not. Because it's tracking with a different side of the New Testament. Follow me to verse 12. It looks like a lamb. It's lamb-like, but in verse 12 it says it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and the inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. So this beast speaks for the other beast. This beast comes up to support the other beast. It's not here to toot its own horn. This beast from the earth is here to promote the sea beast. 
Are you beginning to get an idea of who this beast is counterfeiting? Jesus in the upper room with his disciples said, I'm going away. And you're sad that I'm going away. But don't be sad. I will send you another comforter. Here we have another beast. But there Jesus talks about another comforter. I was the one who comforted you. But I will send you another comforter. And who is that? According to John, it's the Holy Spirit. So remember, we have dragon, sea beast, land beast, a counterfeit three. And here we have a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And Jesus says the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will not speak about himself. He will promote me. The mission of the Holy Spirit on this earth is to replace Jesus on this earth. Jesus is no longer here, no longer doing his miracles, no longer speaking to us by face. But Jesus is here through the Holy Spirit. And this beast from the earth is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit's work on the earth. If you don't believe me yet, go to verse 13. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. Did the Holy Spirit ever do that? It's called Pentecost. When tongues of fire came down of heaven and landed on all of those who followed Jesus. The mighty working of the Holy Spirit occurred at Pentecost. At the end of time, there'll be a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. There'll even be a counterfeit of Pentecost. It will seem like the Holy Spirit is work. Everybody's going to get excited. This will seem like the true final work of Jesus, except things will not be as they seem to be. In verse 15, it says, He was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast. This beast from the earth gives breath. And in both Hebrew and Greek, the word for breath and the word for spirit is the same word. This is a counterfeit spirit of God. Why am I telling you this? Why are we doing all of this? Because in the last days of earth's history, things will not be as they seem to be. People will think they're dealing with the true God. People will be worshiping. They'll be gathering together in churches and synagogues and mosques seeking to honor God. And yet an enemy will come called Satan, dragon, and his allies and portray themselves as God. If we had more time, I would show you that in 2 Thessalonians, it even predicts that Satan will come and take the place of Jesus, will impersonate Jesus physically on this earth. I think a lot of Christians will be ready to follow after. If somebody comes down to this earth and he looks like Jesus from the movies, and he's nice to people, and he heals people, and he says beautiful things come together, so who's not going to want that? But the message of revelation that is so powerful here is that at the end of earth's history, things will not be as they seem to be. That people will honestly seek to follow what they think is right and be completely off. Counterfeits are no use if they're totally different. Counterfeits only work, how? If they look just like the original. The story of Revelation is warning us that not everything that calls itself religion is from God. Not anything that, everything that names the name of God is truly of God. Not everyone who says, Jesus, Jesus, Lord, Lord, is of God. At the end of verse history, things will not be as they seem to be. And that is a message that Seventh-day Adventists feel called to give to the world. Because somebody has to do it. Somebody needs to absorb the story of Revelation 13 and say, it's telling us that the end of time, things will not be as they seem to be. 
And what is the payoff for those of us sitting here today? What does that tell us about our lives? How are we to be different? I'd like to suggest three things as I close. Number one, if there's going to be a great final deception, if it'll be a matrix-like experience at the end, if people will think they're following God and go down a wrong track, if what they see and what they hear and what they touch deceives them, how are we going to survive such a deception? And the answer is only by knowing the prophecies of the Bible. By knowing what the Bible teaches, those who are in touch with God's word will not be deceived. That's the message of the book of Revelation. How can you get there? How can you be at the place where you will not be deceived when the end time comes? First of all, I suggest that we study the Bible like we've never studied it before. If you've never heard any of what I've about just said to you, it's time to study the Bible like you've never studied it before. It's time to pray as we've never prayed before. The third thing I'd like to suggest, it's time to distrust ourselves as we never had before. If there's one thing I've learned in history, I can be totally convinced of something and be wrong. My wife reminded me of that on the way up this morning. This is not going to embarrass you, hon. You're, you were right. Okay? I'm admitting that publicly right now. <laughs> you know, so she remembered a story one way, and I remembered the story a different way. And she was right. And she said, I was afraid to tell you because you're so, you know, convinced when you think something. And she's right. We can be totally convinced of something and be wrong. So one of the things I think with our praying and with our studying, we need to do so in the understanding that it's possible that on one point or another we've been wrong and we need to learn what is right. Because when the end time comes, the counterfeit will seem real. And the safest place for us to be at that time is to truly know God's word and to truly be melded with it so that it becomes part of who we are. That is the reason Seventh-day Adventists are in this world today. Because Seventh-day Adventists have studied these prophecies and have begun to see these are very serious times. These are times when knowing the word is crucial. And the message that Seventh-day Adventists have been called to give to the world is things will not be as they seem to be. My prayer for you today, whether you're part of the Seventh-day Adventist tradition or not, my prayer for you today is that God will touch your heart and say, I got to be serious. These are serious times. You look around the world today, these are serious times. People are afraid about the economy. You know, that debt is piling up so big, you know that one day that's going to pop. Maybe it's not tomorrow, but it sure looks kind of ominous. You go over to the Ukraine and so on. Those Russians have got enough nukes to wipe us out 20 times over. That hasn't changed. And we can see our government officials not knowing what to do. You know, do we get aggressive and say, you've got to stop? Or do we try to be nice and hope that they stop? And, you know, the government seems out of control. Healthcare seems out of control. I know about that, La Melinda. You know, healthcare seems out of control. Uh, faith seems out of control. The economy seems out of control. The world is in a very challenging place. And as I said, we don't know if it's going to be one day or one month or one year or a decade. But we recognize that we're in very serious times. And the call of God is that in these serious times, to study as we've never studied before, pray as we've never prayed before, and to do both of those with a truly honest and open heart, willing to learn whatever God would teach us. Because God's not going to leave you alone. God's not going to let you be deceived. 
If you are open and willing to learn, and, I, and one thing I've learned in life, I'm not always that open. I'm not always that teachable. One of the greatest challenges most of us have is the lack of a teachable spirit. But to open the Word of God and to open ourselves to Him, to be taught by Him through the Word, that is what we need as we approach the end of verse history. Now, this afternoon, going to unpack it a lot bigger. Going to talk about this whole remnant concept. What exactly the message is to take to the world in that time of deception. And why that message is the most important message. Whether you're Christian, Jewish, or Muslim this morning. This afternoon's message is the one thing all three of those religions are looking for right now. And the message of the remnant in the book of Revelation has the answer to the problems of the world today. And that can be demonstrated from Scripture and from history, and I'm going to do it this afternoon. So I invite you to be there at that time. Let's pray. Dear Lord, it's a sobering message to realize that things will not be as they seem to be. As we look candidly at our own lives and our own experience, we realize how easy it is to be fooled. How easy it is to hear a report that says, well, you eat these berries and you'll have no more disease, you know? And we jump on it, we hope for it, we pay extra bucks for it, and then find out, well, that's not quite the way things are. And over and over we find it's easy to just run after the latest and then find that we've made a mistake. Dear Lord, touch our hearts. Open our hearts to you. Open our hearts to your word. We've come a long way with you. That's why we're here this morning. We wouldn't be here if we were not walking with you. But Lord, we want to walk more thoroughly. We want to learn more deeply. We want to follow you more nearly. We pray for that in the name of Jesus. Amen.